Thank you all for coming. My name is Marcelo Rios. I'm the assistant director at the, uh, for the labor unit at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. I'm joined by David Veroli of DDC. Louis Coletti, uh, okay, who's DDC. talking right now? Yeah, who's talking right Lewis, now? Please, I'm trying to help. come and sit down. There'll be a Q&A period. You'll have your opportunity to mingle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help out one of your I understand that. I understand that. They're David's contractors. And okay. Jay Vidami, President and CEO of Tishman. Yes. All right. There's his, uh, his image. Very yeah, nice. It's the same. Look the same, right? Thank you very much. Me, I'm in disguise. I got the, the bad guy beard going. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah that's very that's different. That's why when you said you're in the camera, yeah. I said I don't see you. But now I know. Now you see me. Just look in the eyes. You look the glasses. Yeah, it's a disguise. And I personally shop at the Donald Trump store of hair. <laughs> it's changed a little bit. <laughs> so we will get right into it. Understanding project labor agreements. Project labor agreement, we have a definition. It's an agreement by an owner here in the city of New York with construction trades that all bidders must agree to as part of a responsive bid. Subcontractors to be used by prime contractors on a city contract must also agree to the terms of the PLA, bless you, to be approved. Some key concepts. Bidders that are sent to the project labor agreements need not be signatory to any other union agreement. Thus, open shop contractors that don't have union agreements are able to agree and bid. And one little footnote I want to add to that, and I hear this isn't happening, you really don't have to sign another agreement. You may go to the hall and say, I need labor, and they may tell you sign this temporary employer agreement. And there may be a couple more bucks in the wage and benefit. You don't have to sign that. All you really have to do is present a copy of your letter of assent to get labor. If a hall tells you you got to sign this temporary employer agreement, call your contracting agency, they'll call me, we'll get the local on the horn and straighten this out. Just a good little tip. Another key concept is that all of the provisions in the PLA apply to all contractors and all subcontractors on those city projects subject to a PLA. Under the PLA, <coughs> another key concept is that Contractors and subcontractors <coughs> use union labor referred by the building trades, and all benefits for trade workers will be paid to union benefit funds on a timely basis. So be mindful of your cash flow. You know, this is one of the issues with the PLA in some in, in cases is that the benefits there's a lag between when the benefits are paid, and that's not consistent with state law. You got to pay within a week, two weeks, you know, depending on your pay cycle but you can't let it lag a month, two months, three months. It's a big problem, so make sure you have the cash flow. Obviously to pay your wages, but also pay the benefit funds for the respective trade unions. Work covered by the New York City PLAs, specified new construction has its own PLA. DEP buildings and plants within the city of New York. And the DEP ground out water bypass tunnel has a PLA in the Hudson Valley. It's a very large, PLA in terms of dollar value, it's about $800 million worth of work. And um, finally, the PLA that will probably affect most of you is the programmatic PLA for building renovation, renovation, rehabilitation and repair. The agencies covered by this PLA are the Department of Design and Construction, Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Sanitation, the Parks Department, Administration for Children's Services, the Department for the Aging, Department of Homeland Services, Corrections, Health and Mental Hygiene, Human Resources Administration, the Fire Department, and the Police Department. This PLA covers any construction or standardized service bids that involve city-owned buildings. It includes repair and maintenance bids where repair work dominates the contract, and the way the city figures this out is based on the dollar value in aggregate of uh, repair versus maintenance when they estimate. If it's 51% or more repair, the PLA is going to be included. If it's 51% or more maintenance work, then the PLA will be excluded from the job. But you'll know that in the onset. When you look in the city record, there won't be a notice. And if there's any confusion, always ask at the pre-bid conference for clarification. Because it's obviously going to affect your price if you're bidding on the work. The format of the PLA is by the City of New York. They, the provisions of the PLA adjust existing prevailing local agreements. It's important to note that the adjustments do not cut regularly hourly pay and benefits rate or freeze pay and benefits. The local collective bargaining agreements references Schedule A in the PLA 
they, they govern where the PLA does not override. It's a very important part to keep in mind. Um, essentially, when you sign the PLA, you're signing the PLA document and you're also agreeing to the collective bargaining agreements where the PLA is silent. What will be most different for contractors working under a PLA who ordinarily do public work on an open shop basis? There are a few things. First and foremost, there is no splitting of workers between trades. And basically what that means, on an open shop prevailing wage contract, you can have one person doing three hours carpentry work and four hours laborers work. And you can list them on the, on the certified payroll doing three hours at the carpenter's rate and four hours at the laborer's rate. Under the PLA, that doesn't happen. One worker, one trade. So you'd have to have two, two workers to do that work under the PLA. Um, be mindful of it, and this, this comes into play with your scheduling. You don't want to, given that the PLA guarantees an eight hour day, you don't want to schedule a lot of days at three hours, four hours for individual trades. You want to try to bundle the work so that the workers are getting the full eight hour day. Um, there's union referral and hiring. You must get referrals from the union for the first seven workers. The eighth worker can be a contractor or subcontractor's bring along worker. Uh, that being said, any non-union worker on a PLA job must be registered with the union. Contractors may send back unproductive referrals, but note if you send back a shop steward, that can be a grievance. Uh, payment of benefit funds are into joint trustee funds as per Article 11 of the PLA. Benefit funds are to be paid by the contractor on a timely basis, and workers not in the union are subject to an agency shop fee in lieu of union dues and that fee is equal to or less than union member dues and is withheld from wages. New York City PLAs and MWBEs, there is the city certified MWBE bring along for contracts under a million dollars. So for contracts between a dollar and five hundred thousand dollars, the MWBE firm can bring the second, the, the second, the fourth, the sixth, and the eighth worker onto the job as a bring along worker per trade. That's per trade. So if you have multiple trades, you've got to do that count for each trade. And for contracts between $500,000 and $999,000, the, um, the second, fifth, and eighth workers per trade can be brought along onto the job. MWBE firms that become union signatories get to bring all employees for the applicable trade, subject to union standards of proficiency. And very important key duty for contractors and subcontractors working on PLA contracts, read the PLA and read your contract very carefully. Know the terms of the PLA that your contract or subcontract is subject to. So if a, subcon if a prime reaches out to you as a sub and says, we want you to work on this PLA job, the first thing you ask for is a copy of the applicable PLA. It's important to note that there are many different PLAs each PLA has its own specific terms and conditions. For example, you've got the old 2009 PLAs that the city has and the new um, revisions in the 2015 PLAs. That in and of itself is gonna be confusing and you gotta know the difference. Moreover, the 2015 PLA changes are not retroactive. So if your subcontract or contract is subject to the 2009 terms, you follow the 2009 PLA to the letter. 2015 PLA strictly applies to work that's covered, you know, that was awarded post a certain date covered by that PLA. And um, the SCA has its own PLA, NYCHA, I think they're working on if they don't have a PLA, HHC, there's a lot Everybody of them. Everybody has there. their own PLA. Yes. It's not one, it's not one thing that it's, it's a standard PLA. Absolutely, so Abs that's correct. Well, except if you go back to Marcel's slide, the renovation PLA that DDC is part of, parks, everybody, we all have the same PLA. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the big point is that's one PLA covering a lot of agencies. There's other PLAs. If you want to talk about SCA work, if you want to talk about HHG, those are different, different terms. So know the PLA your contract is um, applies to. Okay. Bottom line. Yeah. Just know which owner you're working for. Okay. Yes. And then maybe they have their own They'll, tweaking in there, right? Yeah. Instead yeah. of 6 one, you bring in 5 one. Yeah, all sorts of things. Yeah, you got to look at them carefully. Um, and finally, there are online resources out there for the New York City PLAs. 
We've got the MOX PLA website, and that's the hypertext link. At that site, you can download the PLAs. You can download a frequently asked questions document that'll probably address a lot of your questions, and I highly suggest doing that before you, you ask questions. Um, not here, of course. You can ask whatever you want here. There's also uh, the union contact list. We have a more extensive PLA presentation for vendors. This, what we have here, these 10 slides, are a condensed version to cover the 10 minutes for the purpose of this panel. But the presentation that I, I did about a month ago, in the past month, was about two hours long. And there's 33 slides and a lot of information that'll be very helpful for you, to and you. where is that? You go to this link, and okay. there's a, a hypertext link there for you to download it. Right. Okay, the other thing I want to plug is the city record online. Um, particularly for, both for primes and subs. Primes, you check out what the city's soliciting, you know, on a regular basis. For subcontractors, you can actually search awards and find out who was awarded what, you know, and basically reach out if you feel you can offer, you know, your services to the project. You can inquire if there's work for you as a subcontractor. Look on the city record online for the recent awards. And with that, that's my, my short overview of the PLAs. I want to open things up to the panel. So what I'll do is I'll start, and then we'll get into really why you're here. I mean, we want you guys to ask questions. You know, you heard the speeches downstairs. Some of you may not have heard me. Uh, the acoustics stink in this building. Uh, it's a wonderful building, but we recognize it has some shortfalls. So very, very quickly and briefly, I'm, I'm David Froley. I'm the general counsel and deputy commissioner with DDC. What I talked about downstairs, what I'm going to reference here is, we want you to be successful. We want you to get 100% of your contract, whether you're the contractor or the subcontractor working on one of our projects. It's not something you're gonna hear a lot from other owners, but we're, we're an owner and we're a government agency. And so for us to be successful, we need you to be successful. And it's really one beautiful circle of life because the more successful you are, the more taxes you pay. Everything works out, we get to do more projects. It's, it's that basic. We have made everything available on the internet, whether you're going to the Mayor's Office of Contracts website or our new website. Our new website just rolled out a couple of weeks ago. We have also pushed out, starting on July 1st, every contract that DDC enters into is now available immediately on the website once it's quote unquote registered by the city controller. So in the old days, if you wanted a contract or a payment bond or performance bond, you had to go through the Freedom of Information Law. We're trying to make this easier. We're trying to push it out to you. So now you have available, especially for the subs, if you want to know the contract or the payment bond, just go to our website. It's only going forward. We're not going backwards retroactive. Because if you heard one of the slides downstairs, I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of projects. Briefly on the project labor agreements. DDC actually has three project, four project labor agreements in, in use right now. We have the 2009 project labor agreement which covered a period of about four, and a half, four years and six months. That project labor agreement covers projects that will probably go for another five to seven, maybe even 10 years. Hopefully not 10 years, but we understand that it can happen. So you have to, I mean, Marcelo's point is really critical. Make sure you understand what project labor agreement you're working on. Our second project labor agreement, we call it for new buildings. So in 2009, we did two PLAs. One was for the renovation work, and one was for new buildings. They're slightly different. So if you're working on a brand new building, I see you pointing, so I don't know if you're working on a new building. Are you guys working on a new building? He is. He is? Okay. So he's operating under a slightly different project labor agreement. So that's number two. Number three is the project labor, labor agreement that just got executed, that we're here to talk about and hopefully answer your questions. That's the general renovation. So all contracts, all bids going forward will have that project labor agreement in it. And that's a four-year period as well. So it'll expire in 2018. The fourth project labor agreement is, and the gentleman sitting uh, across from me, is in the world we call Build It Back. DDC is a government agency. We do commercial buildings for the city of New York. We are now in a new world. We're helping the city on the Sandy recovery. So we're now in the house building business, which is something very new for us. We have a separate standalone project labor agreement that the man directly across from me really helped steward and negotiate, Alan Paul. And this is the resident expert. So, you know, we're, we're going to try and help you, but this is the man you definitely want to get the business card if you're in the Build It Back program. In addition, we're going to have, we also will have, I think, yeah, the execution copies traveling around this city right now. There'll be a new 
new building, PLA, for 2015. So those are all the project labor agreements. One last caveat, and then I'm going to shut up and turn it over, because these are the experts that you really want to hear from. Uh, I'm just the guy with the funny hair. The, the um, DDC has two things that goes on. You're on the fourth floor. We're, we have three floors in this building. The floor above me is our public buildings. That's all vertical construction. They operate under the project labor agreements. Below me on the third floor is the infrastructure world. That's Deputy Commissioner McFarland. That's sewers, water mains, street reconstruction repairs. There's no project labor agreement there. So if you're a contractor that does infrastructure work, there is no PLA. But if you're in the building vertical construction, there is a PLA. And again, Marcelo's point is, is so critical. Know what PLA you're working under. Please read your documents. We want you to be successful. We want you to get 100% of what the work that you have done and that you have requisitioned for. So thank you again for coming. And now I guess we'll turn it over to you unless the gentleman have some introductory comments. Yeah, I get to start out a little bit. Uh, I'm the moderator here, so I don't have to really answer any difficult questions. <laughs> really, just, unless Christine in the back uh, asked me how many homes we have completed or elevated or renovated at this point. Tishman is one of our Build It Back construction managers. We, we have the uh, Borough of Queens. But, but let me start off with Lou Letty of BTEA. Lou, why is it so important for M&WB firms to, to really uh, understand the PLA reach out and embrace labor and become comfortable with it. These are complex documents and you have to make a business decision about where you want your and how you want your business to grow. Uh, with the number of PLAs we have in the private sector over the next four or five years, there's about 20 to 30 billion dollars worth of work between DASNY and all the city PLAs build it back, $30 billion worth of work. To me, that's, that's the perfect transition uh, program for you to make a decision about whether you want to sign on full-time to be a union contractor, because you could bid every single one of those jobs over the next couple of years and only have to sign a single agreement for that job while you're going through that determination as to whether you want to sign on full-time. Um, because the reality is, in, in many of the, the larger private sector jobs in healthcare, uh, it's still this is still a city dominated by unions. And at that point, there are no such type agreements in those private sector, even if there is a PLA. There are none, none of that you can sign a site agreement. You either you're all in and you're all, you're all out. And that's a very significant decision for you to make uh, in your business. So these public sector PLAs give you an, an incredible opportunity to make some money, uh, learn how the process works. Uh, it's very different than many of you. How many general contractors are here in the room? Uh, open shop, non-union. Okay, so you might be doing, as, as, as was said before by Marcelo, you may be doing carpentry, labor, well you can't do that in a union environment. You have to be signatory to two different trades. Okay, you can't have one person do that. We wish we had your model, but that's a whole different story. Um, my suggestion to you, and, and, and David's been repeating it, understand the documents you get. There's really two documents. There's the PLA itself, and there's the collective bargaining agreement that's specific to the trade that you're performing the work in. Because you'll find many terms and conditions well, they'll refer to uh, attachment A, which is the collective bargaining agreement. I think in, in the CBA, you might be able to find the actual wage rates. Uh, if not, you need to go to this website and, and call the union hall and make sure you get the right wage rate so that when you're estimating the job, you're putting the right numbers in. Um, all this work is prevailing wage. If you don't understand the prevailing wage, you need to understand the prevailing wage. Uh, build it back's a little different. Uh, build it back, the PLA that's, that's affiliated with that is a, it was a private sector PLA that was adopted for, for residential work. I'm not sure whether there are those drag along clauses in that particular no, document. But there, but no, there are no. It's, it's, it's our outer borough PLA. Right. which is um, 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 a 20% off wage benefit cut 
uh, uh, eight hours. Um, um, standby is at our discretion. It's it's a, it's 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 a it's a it's a basic PLA. All right. Well, here here becomes an important point. Then you had a question. My suggestion to everybody here is when you reach out to the respective trades to get people from from their halls on this uh, residential document everything because my guess is going to be you're not going to get anybody that's willing to take a 20% pay cut in this market and make sure you protect yourself uh, against them and against the owner or the prime contractor is going to say what did you do the PLA requires you to do this here's what I did I think they didn't refer me any people uh, and then then you probably keep your own workforce right document everything document request, everything. if they tell you we're not going to refer try to get something document. in writing if they refuse to give you something in writing you take notes I spoke to this guy at 9 right. p.m. on this day you keep a log of all of that to protect yourself so will we have to take the people to get them on something or train or, or, or just start using them and paying them no, they're the trained. They're, they're, trained. they're trained and they're trained and they're coming no, if to they you. don't give us anything and we use our own guys you can you to go so know your guys know what to do no I mean they oh. know everything but you know like they, they could be like oh you need this you need in the, this in the, in the build it back there is no drag along clause okay. that, that only exists in the other one so you have to get all your manpower uh, from all your workers from the units so now the next question is, are you getting good people from the unions? Right. Which you have a right to, they're at will employees, you have a right to, a person comes one day and you don't like them, you can get rid of them for any reason at all. You have to pay them for that day. Your supervisors are a little more tricky. So you can keep your supervisors provided they're not physically doing any work. So my guess is, is that you, you're gonna have a combination. You're gonna keep your supervisors who are generally going to tell the men what to do. You, you have to hire a foreman and a shop steward and the other men from the union hall, and you're gonna to have to do what everybody else does, which is basically weed through the men until you get a crew that you feel comfortable with. Now, with the wages, I can tell you what, what we're seeing is that not every man takes a 20% cut. A man or woman takes a 20% right. cut. There are certain people who have higher skill levels that can go across the street, but if you look at how construction is done, about 40% of the people are actually doing the work. The rest, 60%, and that number varies, are moving stuff, or are lifting right. stuff, or are cleaning stuff. Or, and those people, you can you can have a a, a, um, a wage cut on. So if you look at like iron workers, like structural work, your your raising gang is probably not taking the wage cut. They're they're all highly skilled people, but people putting bolts in probably take. So the issue was, you know, the PLAs were really created in this market probably in 2007 and 2008 when the collapse of the stock market happened, right? The unions had to figure out a way of how to get work back in the outer boroughs that were traditionally going 100% open shop or 100% non-union. So they came up with this wage package for the outer boroughs, did not include Manhattan. Uh, it now since can be applied to Manhattan. So the unions are trying as much as they can to increase their man, man hours per year. Uh, their membership from 120,000 to 130,000 has been floating. But generally, uh, uh, most of the unions have virtually full employment. So uh, this program allows them to get more apprentices in. As Alan said, unloading the trucks isn't necessarily something that a journeyman carpenter would do. In New York, they were doing that. Now it gets to the point where an apprentice could do it. So uh, my question to Alan is, if you're a contractor in this room and you have 10 people uh, that have been doing your work traditionally and they're doing uh, drywall and the unions uh, have nobody to supply, under the PLA, what can you do? Normally the PLA say that if they can't provide people, whether in the CBA or the PLA, you can go to other sources and the union has to accept them in the union, at least as a provisional workers, if they can't supply people. Okay. So they they have a time frame, and I don't know. 48 if hours? Well, hours well, you PLA, yeah, I'm not happens. sure of this PLA, but, but typically, even in the CBA, it says that, that, that if, if they can't supply you men, then you can go to any other source to get men. Um, he's saying if that never happens, it doesn't happen. Well, no, I think what he's going to say is they, it never happens over a long term. Yeah. On a job-by-job -job basis, they have to accept those workers. 
because when you're done with the job, they're no longer in the union. And, they're and, out. And you're going to find it varies by union. Like like you're, you're a mechanical contractor. Right. I know Richie Roberts is pretty progressive. Um, O'Connor is pretty progressive. Uh, the first thing you should do is ask them for the outer borough wage rate sheet. Yeah. Which, which the unions have. And then you should have a discussion if you're not signed with those unions. Of, you know, I have some key men I want to bring, um, and I want to maintain my diversity on the job. And the unions generally are fairly reasonable. Some of them are, and you should you should ask them what you want. One thing with unions is we don't negotiate against ourselves. If you want something, you should ask for it. Because sometimes you're able to get it. My main thing was that when you know, like we're doing residential work, right? We go there, and the, the work is only for an hour or three hours, right. and then what do we do? We just pay the guy for the whole, because we just don't, uh, you know. Uh, Depends on what. Steam fitters are just doing mechanical work, and, and, and the yes. sheet metal is doing. That's stuff. why you have to understand what's in the document, because there's many of the trades have minimum. You call a man to bid if it's for a half an hour, an hour, you've got to pay him four hours pay. But you're bidding under the PLA guidelines. So you're bidding yeah. under the assumption that you're not going to have a carpenter uh, do sheet metal work and the next hour he's going to do a sweat joint. So, you yeah. so everybody's got the same rules of engagement. Yeah. I would think that if you have men now that I would say they're 60% scale, the unions would be very happy to say to you, bring your own lead there at 80% because I don't have a guy at 100% that's exactly. going to take 80%. You so you're better exactly. off under this agreement. I don't think, uh, you know, I think the time is right. It's not as if there's thousand or two thousand people sitting in the on the benches in the halls I think they'd be very happy obviously your your person out of 60 percent is going to 80 they would like to have him forever that's man hours that are going to them and that's for their benefits right it's all about who gets on the prevailing wage it goes to the man and then this it goes to the to the hall by man hours. I so I think they'd be very happy uh, getting more people in now. We've been telling them we want 200,000 union members, not 120,000, but they have to be under a different wage scale than everybody has been used to. So earlier you had said that in terms of um, your business model, so if you're an open shop, yes. do you have to sign in order to do this work? Do you have to sign yes. the union agreement? No. For this no. job, oh no, 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 Right. You may want to go and show it to your attorney. Yes. You want to be sure that it's only a site agreement. For that particular job. For that job. particular job, not that you, they, you've now signed up for anything going forward until you make that decision later on in your business. All you need to sign is the letter of assent. You don't have to sign a temporary employer agreement. That's right. That's right. very important. Right. Don't sign anything else. Just a letter of assent. That's all you need to show up with. I, 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 I want I, I, very and important. That was versus letter of assent versus Tem other. It's called a temporary employer agreement. Okay. I, I, I want to add something because we have something that's unique in New York City because I negotiate PLAs out of the city. The unions in New York City have accepted the fact that the PLA is the collective bargaining agreement, and you do not need to be a union contractor. It if is you exactly work, the same. If thing. you work outside the city. Unions generally have said that to sign the PLA, you need to be a union contractor if you're performing work. So whatever we're telling you here is just it's in the five boroughs in New York, York. So because that because that's not how every PLA works. Okay. But but the we have had contractors on our jobs, private jobs, coming from out of state or who are non-union, who become union just for the PLA, which is probably the fairer way of doing it. The second thing I want to say is, depend if you have a problem with a union. If it's a DDC PLA, you need to go back to DDC. If it's building back, you work for Tishman, you come to us, and then we'll fix the problem with the union. Because we, we, we are committed to complying with the union agreement, and the union's uh, leadership is generally committed to complying with the union agreement. The problem happens is somewhere down the line, things change, and, and we need to make sure that the agreement is. The other thing that we're going to be offering, the, the organization I represent, the Building Trades Employers Association, uh, is an association of associations that represents every trade union contractor in New York City, from large Tishman's, Turner's, Lend Leases, to car carpentry, plumbing, electrical. 
and we're going to be offering a technical assistance program. Okay. And, and watching this, I want to talk to DVC and, and Mox later about how we can link. We were going to create a website so that if you have questions about the documents themselves and what they mean, that we could help you through technical assistance. We, we've retained as a consultant uh, John Spavitz, who helped write many of the city PLAs. Um, so there, I, I think technology is not my strength, but I'd like to talk to DDC later about how we even make that. If this is the one place you go, we link them in. So if you have a question about uh, what what it means, if we if we can't answer it, remember I have 27 different contractor associations, um, and we can then link you into if you're a plumbing contractor. Well. Here's Stu O'Brien's telephone number, and if there's a question, you can call the Plumbing Contractor Association. I, I can say this, my good friend Gary's not here. What I've always said, which I've never understood, is that you as a contractor have a question. Your first, the first place you go is to a contractor association. You don't ask the business agent walking around because he's going to tell you, well, you need four carpenters on that job. Well, maybe you do, because the documents are so overwhelming. But you have the ability to ask whether or not that's correct. Because if you just assume it, you're going to be halfway through the job and finding out that, that you're out of money. So you should be talking to, one, to the BTA or one of its 27 associations to give you some guidance. Now, we cannot get involved if you have a dispute on the actual job. That's where you go directly to your prime contractor to help you resolve that. Um, try to build a relationship with the local business agent. You'll, you'll find that the informal decision-making process will save you a lot of headache so you don't get like I have with all this gray hair. Oh, well, mine is gone already. Well, well you are gone. Uh, but I don't great great shop, so. Yeah, we're yeah. going to provide that kind of support. Uh, because it is, there are two very complex documents and if you have not worked in this environment before, you sign your contract and you get documents about 150 pages and you go, oh, you're, well, you're, you're a lawyer, you go figure out. But you have to understand how to implement those documents and address the questions that are going to come up when you're actually doing the job. So are you referring and how you guys going? I'm a little late. Mr. Coletti, I want to thank you for a lot of things that you've done in the past, but I remember in 2007, you said that everybody will be coming to the beck and call of the unions with this, with this mandate that is really, in some respect, the hardest thing that I ever dealt with being in an open shop. So here's my question, and I got off the plane, and I want to hand you back this CD, okay. because the reason why I'm handing you back this CD is because I specifically asked you where is the wages? You sent me a CD with every single union um, collective almost bargaining collect agreement. You sent me that collective bargain agreement, and that's not the wages. But here's my question, and it's really seriously: um, We was on a big job, and I won't give the, C the GC's name. It was a hundred and seventy-four thousand dollar project. I'm painting this building, and I'm cranking. I get up to the third floor. I say hello to a, a black gentleman who calls the union up on me. I signed a collective bargain agreement. Now, you just asked the question, I'm gonna explain it. We signed the full breast collective bargain agreement. I knew what I signed. I had to wait two years, no income, no work, to get out of that agreement because I was locked in because you signed, they say they're gonna give you work. Um, no one gives you work in this town, we bid it. But what I'm struggling with, when that agreement was over, we got audit, ladies and gentlemen, you get audit. All of the benefits and everything that we purchased from the worker that I hired, because I'm a working owner, the project labor agreement does not protect my civil rights and my right to work when you're a working owner. You get that? That means I'm owning the business, certified, but I'm a worker. So here's what happened to me. I waited to finish up that collective bargain agreement because I didn't think the city was going to go PLA five boroughs across the five boroughs. I thought that once I got out of that, and the experience, I'm going to tell you, was good and it was hell. 
because I'm a sharp cookie. You taught me a lot. Yeah. I listened to you carefully. I don't know. I should be your nephew or somebody, and I may not be rich. You're making money. But I li- no, I'm not making money. Love that money. Trust but me. T- this is a real. I came far yes. to this. You did. That you, came. No, no. I came here. Years. Like I flew. I yeah. made sure I came to this meeting because I wanted to let you know something. I now. I'm out of my agreement, and I'm I'm like, okay, we 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 came out unscathed. We didn't get too straight. The order is coming out in my favor because I'm a working owner. I didn't I had to surrender the union card, so I didn't have to owe these guys one hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars when that when that when that um, agreement was up. Because if you have even if I don't have work, I got to send them a thousand dollars a week. But my my concern is, are you guys looking at? The pros and the cons of this this mandate that Obama set the, the scale on this because he changed the federal acquisition law to start this PLA and then reversed it, but the states have this ran with this. Here's this concern I have: What is the big issue with the first man in? We own businesses. I have employees. They're scattered now because of this mandate that just split my company apart. What? Why is it? that we cannot use our employees first, that's my first question, where is the wages? The prevent, you made a comment at the meeting that you said, and you and he's a great advocate for you guys, he works for the city, but he sounds like he works for you guys in a roundabout way. I have issues, yeah, look, let me tell you something, this is serious, because I talked to the last commissioner that was here, and, and I didn't get far. But where is the wages? Because a lot of people don't know that that 4% and the check off just went up. You have to call the respective, con- you could either call, my suggestion again. Well, you got the union. You call the contractor association for the information first, rather than the union. Because they are obviously on the other side of the table. You explain who you are and that you signed a PLA and you're a plumbing contractor and can you send over the wage rate that would be my first try. Uh, simultaneous to that, I'd probably call the union, tell them the same story, who you are, uh, to, in order to get the appropriate So the wager. Department of Labor rates do not apply to the project labor agreement, or even have you even looked at it, because I do know by law, you cannot... Alan, um, you want to answer that? Let's get to the question. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. want to ask questions. The prevailing wage lags the union more. wage by six months, because the prevailing wage is set in January, and the union wages go up in July. Yeah. So that's the first problem that. you have. The second thing, the prevailing wages are off by a buck or two an hour because <coughs> they don't include PAC funds, which aren't allowed in the prevailing wage. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, um, um, yeah, like the, um, I'm not. I, I think I'm not sure the dues, but definitely the PAC funds are not in there. So if you see a prevailing wage rate all in of seventy dollars, the union rate is probably seventy-two dollars. So if you go to the state website for prevailing wage, it's going to be really close to what the union wage rate is, um, yeah, uh, except for except for PAC funds and that you have this six month lag. What about the, what but about if you the, estimate your job based on the prevailing wage rate and it's different than what the union rate is, you, you're going to lose money. Yeah. You, 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 no, we know you, that. You, you'd have to increase, because the wage rates increase about three and a half percent a year, and then there's another two or three, so right, you, you probably have to increase it by six to ten percent to cover what is really going on for that six months. And what's the deal with the first man in? Can you guys surrender that to the small businesses? I can, I don't know. What is the school we got? Let me make a a controversial statement here. I'm going to make a controversial statement. These PLAs were the first time that the contracting community was asked for their opinion. Previous ones, we were never asked. Negotiation just went on with labor. Nobody talked to us. We made some recommendations this, this, this time, but we're not sitting at the table. Who's the, sitting the, at the, the table? Negotiate, not even him. Mm-hmm. The negotiating uh, well, the is, 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 with, is, with, is with City Hall and those unions. We suggested that they get rid of the first man in. Is a okay, for to give trade. the MWB contractor a better opportunity to be successful, to let them use their own uh, workforce. There isn't a PLA, city or state, that doesn't have that drag along clause. Um, but what do we do with the workers? But, but let me, can I? Well, hopefully you have other work, uh, other jobs you can put them. I, I, I was involved in a negotiation for uh, a building for the UN, which we spent a lot of time, we spent over a year and a half negotiating, unfortunately the building's not gonna get built, it looks like. 
we spent a lot of time at MWBE in drag -alongs. Our opening position was the first man was from the MWB contract. The unions were like, no, that can't be. I need, we want to have, we don't want anybody who's, who's not in the union working on the job. And a compromise was reached because this is what happens in these negotiations. And it was the 12% and it was kind of what you have there, like the third, the fifth, whatever. But I think you have a very valid point that, 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 that you as a small business should be allowed that first person in. Um, um, and it's something that in negotiations, quite honestly, we probably should fight harder for. Uh, because eventually, the longer you negotiate with the unions, the better chance you have to get something. <laughs> but, well, it's, it's true. The, the, it's, 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 you have to kind of wear them out. Um, um, well, but his, I heavy think civil they, they, his, his heavy civil trades, road companies are so adamant about that clause yeah. because they, I, I you, you know, you, you, yeah. you, your argument yeah. is fair and it keeps you away from the federal, um, it, it, yeah, it plays I, a I, game I, with a loophole with the does, federal Robert, law. I don't mean, but I don't that, mean to be disrespectful, but I think for the purpose okay. of today, no, it is what it is. Yeah, I you're guess. not, it's that, that's, that's and you're, the, and you're in a you, unique situation where you're, and you're also the principal. You have to, and they're saying a lot of the, a lot of jobs we have, there's you know, 400 to 600 people on a project, and it's highly unlikely that the principals of the firms are on the job. Most of most right. of the most of the time most of the small minority firms small principals are. Right. And you mentioned that you and I'm gonna last one. You mentioned that if anything that you would want to do, Lou, yeah. Mr. Coletti, rather, is um, <laughs> is um. My experience with the audit is a killer. You got to have those staffs and everything in order because they were, I, I don't know if they, when I walked out the room, those guys with the big long table must have said, that's a smart you, Munya, or whatever they want to call me, whatever they call me. No, no, but back in the day, it's like, but look, I almost got destroyed and I don't have the money for the accounts. I don't have the money to be sued in federal court, but I came out on stage. But as a contractor, as a general principal, as a that. contractor, working in whether it's the private sector or the public sector today. The single most important thing you can do is get your paperwork in order. Because you will not get paid either from the prime, because you will not get paid from the agent. You won't get paid anywhere. I have to tell you a funny story. Uh, my son uh, was going on, just going on some interviews. He's now working for Tishman. Mm -hmm. He's a smart young man. <laughs> Took after his mother. Uh, yes. But during the interview, um, whoever was interviewing said to him, uh, so tell me how you'd handle a change order. So he went through and handled a change order. He said, when I get done, uh, shake your hand, and we got a deal. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman from Tishman laughed and said, you know, you're the first 30-year-old that I've ever heard that remembers back that far. That process does not exist today. Everything has to be documented or you will you you won't get reimbursed uh, when the audit comes. You, they'll say, "Okay, I believe you, but you have no documentation to prove your case." Paperwork is probably the most single important thing that you can focus on. And if you don't have somebody that's on top of that, you really need to, to, to get that done because it can ruin your business. Well, the union stamp paperwork yeah. is what I was talking about. But anything, but anything, I, yeah, anything. Yeah. Lou's point is absolutely, and it actually goes back to my opening comments. We want you to get 100% of your money. The only way you're going to get there is by the documentation. I'm not sure how it's really working in the private sector. I do believe the private sector is moving much more into the world of paperwork requirements. Oh, it's there. It's there. It's no different. Right. It, okay. Here, everything is we, we have something called an engineering audit officer, EAO. It's terminology. If you start working for government, you need to know it and understand it. They review every single payment requisition that comes through the agency. I'm a former accountant before I became a lawyer. I don't even understand the concept of audit when it looks at every single item. To me, an audit is a sampling. We don't do that. We look at every single payment. So the documentation is critical. Whether you're on a project labor agreement project or a non-project labor agreement, the documentation is critical. The other thing to keep in mind is we are moving much more to an electronic world. We have an electronic payment system. That payment system collects information as well. And if you don't have that information that's current, you're not going to get paid. We don't write checks anymore. It used to be checks that came out of the city when I first started. That, that doesn't exist. Everything is electronic transfer of funds now. 
So these are some really just important concepts to understand. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to, I have two questions and I'd like to have it elaborated. One is, why is the sending back the shops to the automatic grievance? Because I mean in the private sector, where if I have a shop store and my job is not performed, I get rid of it. I don't have a grievance. So why in the PLA is it a grievance? And the second question I'd like you guys to elaborate on is the, I mean, if you're a full union shop and you're on a PLA agreement, um, how do we handle the situation with breaks? There's some of the breaks that is eliminated within the PLA, but the union guys are used to taking their breaks. So, Alan, just. Thank you, right. well, well, the shop steward is a protected individual under the PLA. He's a union representative. So everybody is an at-will employee. You can get rid of for any reason or no reason at all. But the shop steward, we can't because he's appointed by the union to represent the men. You can get rid of a shop steward, but you have to go through the business agent, and you have to have a reason why you want to get rid of the guy. Right. And Other than I don't like the way he looks. Or oh, how about his Actually, work? we did get rid of a shop steward because we didn't like the way he looked. It was acting kind of weird. So, but it was <laughs> the weirdness that got him off the job, not the way he was. Did the looking. union grieve it? No, no, no because it can because, be a grievance. Because, it's not always. Yeah, yeah. So, it but, can be. but we had to go through a process to get him off. Um, so they're protected because the union wants their representative protected. They don't want someone reacting saying just because I'm defending the man, you got rid of the guy. You can't do that. So that's the first. That's the first thing. And the second question. Second was it had to do with the breaks. What well, the. The PLAs normally put breaks in there, or the CBAs have breaks, and they're negotiated breaks, just like any other work rule. I just got and a PLA that we just, uh, for the, the job that we, the contract we were just awarded in. One of the benefits, I guess, of for the PLA is the elimination of breaks. Now, as a full union shop, I mean, the guys are used to having their breaks, and that's what I want you guys to elaborate you, on. You, the, any union agreement, including a PLA, is a floor. You can certainly go, if your business model you know, wants it, you can certainly go higher. It's like wages. When you have a CBA wage, that's the floor. Nothing stops you from paying more hourly. The benefits are, 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 are statutory the way the PLA is set. So if you, you have men and you feel that it's productive for you, for the men to take a 15 minute break because they're really good producers, that's up to you. The only yeah, thing that you can't do, and I want to caution this with everybody, is you can't pay somebody for not working. See, that's, that's yeah. that was the <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. question because <laughs> but, I mean, you have a CM the, who's an agent CM yeah. with some of the jobs, and we're a GC on this particular yeah. project. The agency, and we have a sign-in sheet for the guys that my super is required to give to them at the end yeah. of the day. So these guys take their break and they, it's still an eight hour day. He said, well, it's, it's short, it's 30 seven minutes. Hours. Yeah. It, no, you can't, you can't because break. the way the CV is written, it's a paid break. Right. I, I mean, I mean, that's how it's written. It's like you, you could, uh, you, you uh, could yeah, negotiate a paid month PLA, break if they wanted to do this it. This specific PLA eliminates the breaks. Okay, that's what I'm so, so, so you, you have, you right. have a potential problem there because because they're always um, short eight hours. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you can't you, do that. You'd be short that time. You'd have to document. You'd have to document that you're 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 paying the people just for pay the them. break. You're giving them the break, and it's so above and beyond. Pay. And you'd have to make sure everything, including the people auditing, understand that because sometimes the auditors don't. Know. You're right. That could be a problem. Nobody says it's a perfect world. The other benefit, you know, I had the PLA. Even though it's laborious, it was uh, it was a good deal to negotiate for build it back. But it also allowed, we didn't talk about CSIPs, so this is a project under Build It Back that has a uh, contractor controlled insurance program. I was going to say something. Which, which, so in order to go to the market that has to insure large projects like this, because quite honestly, uh, for Tishman, who is the design builder of the project, you would never be able to give us the proper insurance that would allow us to use you, whether or not you are an owner or not out there, right? We would always say the limits have to be up here. You wouldn't be able to get it. Your costs would be off the charts. So we went to the city, to Dave, and we did the same thing at PSAC uh, to allow a CSIP to be done. So when the market saw that this project would be union built under a PLA, there was more comfort level with them knowing that the workers' comp and the CGL was going to be with trained workers. So that allowed them to say, okay, we're comfortable with the product, we're going to put the job under a rolling CSIP. So 
The good news is that benefits you, a lot of money right there. and it's a lot of money, right. but it also allows contractors who otherwise would not be able to meet our limits because I'm guaranteeing the cost of the construction here with the city doing a CSIP. So the PLA was very advantageous to the world insurance market for this project, which is a billion dollars worth of work. We literally had to go to the world markets, to London, to get the insurance for this a job. Lot of London, it's a lot true. of people went to their different things, but everybody, each CM went to their own model. At the end of the day, we did our own thing, but with the city's help here, uh, we got the CSIP. So it allows people to come, and the workers' comp and the CGL is part of the program. One of the things that he was just mentioning, because in the CD that you offered me, I read, I went to the union, and what I noticed, Mr. Coletti, is I didn't even know that the union ratified their contract when it came down to me. It went from 2015 to 2019. I never got anything in the mail about it, but when I read this, um, your documents, your CDs, the whatever you put together, documents. The, the, the document, um, I noticed that my union aligned itself with other unions and, you know, like they are, it, I, I, I'm just a one trade company, I mean one trade trade, and now, under my collective bargain agreement, if it's a full one, that's why I'm trying to play with the PLA, is I get locked into all the other agreements that they yeah. align themselves with. You know, like the painters' unions with the uh, glazers, this one, that one, that one. They added a few of the trades to their collective bargain agreement. And one thing I noticed, too, that's on the full breast thing, but with the project labor agreement, is that the same thing? Because the, pro the PLAs are no different than the actual union agreement, but the only difference is it's a, it releases you after the project. No, but but it follows the same. Problem, it is different. The PLAs do have different terms and conditions. And that is your primary document to follow. When, when, when there are conflict conflicts between the CBA and a PLA, if the PLA addresses the issue, the PLA supersedes. Governance over the, okay. Can I ask a question? Good morning, my Good morning. name is Ingrid Bonnet. My company is Warby Solutions Scott. I'm a general contractor. I have two questions. I just finished the pro a project with DBC, I, but I worked as a sub. Um, the, one of the issues I had with Warby was with the shop steward from the carpenter union. The carpenter's union. Um, this, he, the project went to stages, the scope of work went to stages. We started with the carpentry, then we went to painting and taping. So when he's work, when he's the score for getting it was over, we went we had to go before the some of the other scopes. So he goes and he files for unemployment. So I'm saying, but first of all, how can he do that? He's a union, he's from the union shop, he's not my employee. Plus, you can you will hire for a specific scope of work, it's done. How can you go file for it's all the losses? He's out of work. Many, many of them do it, he's out of work. He's out of work. If you laid right. a, if you've laid that worker off until somebody else picks him up. Or her up to put him on a job under the law, he's unemployed. He laid off, I didn't lay him off. I told him once the cabinet starts again, he's going to come back. But I didn't lay him off. No, but once there's a slag in the work, he's, yeah. he's yeah. technically laid off. He has to meet all the criteria right. from the State right. Department of Labor. You don't have to tell him you laid off, you just laid off. But the funny thing is, no, you have to tell him. But he didn't see. get paid because he was making so much money, so that, you know. And they will say they're underpaid. Be very careful. That's right. And that's another, part of our negotiating. In, in your project labor agreement, do you have uh, do you have shop stewards? Because if I have, once we go past a certain ratio of men, we get a shop steward. We always try. Well, you know, you try to stay within that. But when you do get a shop steward, are there any working shop stewards? I don't know if I can absorb. If I, yeah, if I rem recall the language right, uh, it's I think. To work. Yeah, well, working store I mean, trades. You get these guys, and they just except, yeah. if, except if they're your guy, correct? Because before, someone had said that if they're from the union, yes, but if the person who is, um, I guess maybe that's not a shop steward, he's the foreman or the. The foreman's your guy. The yeah. foreman is my guy. Everybody. Okay. Works. Well, no, not everybody knows that. No, well, my question about the project labor agreement if I do have a shop steward on my job, is he, it, I mean, there's different he's types. He's supposed I mean, to be working. He has to work. He's supposed to be working. Um, 
you have to insist that he works. He's got to be allowed time to do the union business. Well, you give him the, which the, is, the which is, five is, minutes. He, he, he may need time to because he's got a log book to write down. There. And which that's really, whatever. if there's five men on the and, job and yeah. the steward is there, yeah. probably going to work. Yeah. If there's 100 men on the job, yeah. he's likely he's not going to work. Gotta so watch so it is no, really it's, it's relative. Fair. It's, it's fair because he keeps the paperwork correctly. She had two questions. Yes, she had two questions. I don't elaborate on what the shop steward does. Well, the shop steward is a union representative on the job that you pay for and he he makes sure that um, the uh, CBA the collective bargaining agreement is being complied with that the men are are being treated fairly in accordance with the CBA so in other words if an employer says I want you to work an extra hour but I'm not going to pay you the steward's going to say hey wait a minute you can't do that right so so it, from, from a prevailing wage standpoint the unions are self-policing what the, what the city is doing with prevailing wage. You almost never see prevailing wage violations on a union job because the union will step in way before it reaches. They make sure that the men paid all their benefits all or they benefits send them home. All their hours, that, that right. you're yeah, not making right. them do something right. that's right. dangerous. You know, because I mean, he's not my foreman, he's not my president. No, 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 he's, he, he, is, he is a worker for you, but he's a union representative. He's not there to protect he's, you, he's, okay? He's, That's your question? He's, he's, he's not there to protect you. He's there to protect the union. He's going to want to say that he has to work or something like that. He, 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 I cannot pay him if he doesn't work. No, 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 he, he, he's there to work, but he's also there to represent the men. So say you, have, you ask your men to do something that they think is unsafe. You don't want five men coming up to you. The steward who represents the men is going to come up to you and say that that what you're doing. If he doesn't have his OSHA card, it's the steward who sends him home. Or well, he can sanction the overtime. Yeah. Instead of well, the yes. So it benefits you a little bit too, which so you don't have people coming to a job that are unqualified. He's going to make sure if they don't. What I'm driving at is this: I don't want you to get a table and sit down. I'm telling you, he's a shop steward or whatever. No, that'd be a teamster. Okay. You got the, <laughs> the wrong affiliation. Right. right. So that's it. One table. For you me. can just let them know that you're going to give them the so 45 minutes. As right. as I'm when I, I assign you something to do, you better go and do it because I'm paying you to do it. Right. Okay. Because I'm the one running my, my company and my project, not him. No, but if you're bidding the job, I'm right, you're bidding the job, you, you may assume nothing. that he is doing nothing. No. Right? Something according to no, no, but, but as far as production, as far, as far as work, if, it, if you assume he's doing nothing, your bid will reflect he's doing nothing, and he's not part of the men that's going to help your man hours and put up sheetrock. Make that assumption, right? right? Then, then you're that. always covered, you right? Then it it's in. an upside. And, whatever you and if get he goes get everybody's day. coffee, it's a win-win. Yeah. You've got him to do something. So I don't want him to come here feel like he's the sheriff. Well, something. we know that. He is a sheriff. He's not my, not no, no, my but he is a sheriff for the union. He's for a sheriff. Union, for not the not union. Job, not my own company. No, you're paying him. I'm paying you. You have the pleasure of you have the pleasure of paying him so he can police you. We cannot police me. No, it's me paying him. But it is police. No, no, but it's labor and management. He is policing. So how do you put other questions? Let's get the second question. What second question? Yeah. We have five minutes left. My second question, I heard you talking about change orders. Because right now I'm going through a battle with my with my GC on my change orders. They're saying that you can't charge these. Can, they're saying all I can charge is twenty one percent for my materials and nothing else. But I found that that's not true. That is not true. Well, I'm gonna understand the ins and outs, but time material on a change order is labor and material. So it's, it's, it's so, and a marker. And a marker. So you're so but your contract for build it back No, it's not build it back. Okay, so a build it back would be a DVC contract with Tishman boilerplate that'll show you exactly what you can charge. No, okay. about the DC project, but it's a okay. project a different one. So, I mean, it's just, isn't it the, the general rules for change orders? And there, the general rules for change orders, right? Yeah, don't don't so obey anything that's that has nothing to do with the general rule. Yeah, yeah. Whatever yours, you have to find your subcontract, see what your subcontract says about change orders, get a copy of their contract with us, since it sounds like you're the sub right. to a contractor that's right. in a contract with me, get a copy of that contract, go through our free information law, ask for the copy, because exactly. it's an old contract, I haven't pushed that one out yet, and see what the change order provisions are. Or you have your work, your, your labor rate sheet that every GC in Tishman, I know you don't let them just balloon your course. You'll ask me prior to starting, yeah. give me your labor rate sheet, your yeah. markup per hour, and, and, no, and, no, and, and, that, and no profit no on premium time. And that's it. But when you say 21%, that generally means 15 for the sub, six for the prime. 
but every contract is different. They're not going to look at the words. Look at the words. Yeah. They say, listen to the words. And one last thing for me. How come you? Are have you sure? So <laughs> well, do you, No. If you, if you promise, I promise. Yes. Okay. Then. If you would have had me in a negotiation with the PLA that represents the small minority business, we would all be happy. Because I'm not happy, but I got to live with the nature of the beast. Because Luke Coletti lobby really good. Here's my question. Why not not you in the <laughs> table? Who wasn't even at the table? No, no, I'm we talking about suggestions yeah. and we were not at All the right. table. Well, I can't wait to meet my president because he's the one that started this ball rolling. But here's my question. Why is it so many different PLAs? Why don't you guys just cut the game and just say, hey, New York City, no more right to work say you must project have been in the meeting I have Because this is ridiculous. You 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 you're almost borderlining on if somebody was you know, academically had a Supreme Court judge for a father or a grandfather would be a big contest. But well, why no, public is so sector is different. Private sector private, private, private sector, sector negotiates PLAs based on the market. Well, the right? private sector, so, I get so that means we always want to have it changing. We always want to say the collective bargaining agreement is great for three years of negotiation, but we want to be able to, uh, again, to be competitive with the non-union builders, and that just means we have to get more reductions from labor to allow us as union contractors to stay in business. But the, the public sector, public yes, sector works on a different model. They work on common holidays. They work on staggered starts. They don't have to get a race to the bottom as much as we do in the private sector. So one size does not fit all. And uh, to get a PLA that Allen negotiated project labor agreement for the Tappan Zee Bridge, which was for a $4 billion job, it saved the state $400 million, it survived that. But to say that works for every bridge in New York or every tunnel in New York, unheard of. There's going to be different PLAs for every job. One, side, one suit uh, does not. I thought it was to give the relief for the after the 9 11 and everything, but it looks like the city is really booming. So, I mean, how. It, it really, had, the, uh, the it project really had nothing to do with 9 no? 11. It had everything to do with the recession of 2000. Well, I meant to do with whatever happened. Right. right. Yeah. But, but right. what you have now yeah. is um, it's tough for small. The the comp the open competition. I used to get on your website and just. You said everything. one more. You, you, yeah. You're going. Let's yeah. stop. Yeah. Let's go. Anybody? Yeah. Else? We only have like ten <laughs> minutes. So go. I'm good. With it, bro. Anyone else? Uh, it's not good. This has to do a little bit with build it back. Yes, sir. Uh, how does the um, what's a, a good methodology to meet the section three and the workforce utilization goals utilizing the conditions of the PLA? It seems that. We're having a little difficulty in meeting those goals, uh, um, uh, given the restrictions of PLA for the 30% goal for Section 3. Or, uh, well, so the, could someone the, like me? The Build It Back is completely silent on that because it, it basically comes out of the private sector PLA. So it is, it's the out of borough. Out of borough. Out of borough. It's right. completely silent on that. So really, you have to go back to your contracting documents. And I can tell you that the unions, whether we have information, we have that provision in the PLA or not, want to comply with that. They want to help you with that. Their workforce is a diverse workforce to them. It's not the same workforce that we had in the 1980s. But, try, but, but first getting, there's a large outreach that, yes. that we're doing right now yes. to get these Section 3 workers to the union, and then it seems like the, the apprenticeship programs are well, that's because you're doing it directly if I can make a suggestion you need to call construction skills the city housing authority itself well, yeah we're dealing with that because we're that is that is in a home. memorandum of understanding exactly. that is the way uh, uh, people uh, section 3 go right to the top of the list. I mean we've had to hire them for I the same responsibility yeah. to DDC as you have in bidding it so I had to go to the community oh, and do the same thing as hiring. I had to do uh, it. We're, we have the Section 3 hiring manager for you. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> have, like, so, so thank you for uh, <laughs> thank you for having us meet our goals. <laughs> but, but, but we're also responsible to try to get you hire your subcontractors. Yes, sub the GCs, yes. The small contractors to yep. meet that goal. Got it. And yep. They're, they're, they're running into a little problem. Well, but, but under so, uh, the law, no, but under the law, you, and you, you need to know, under the law, the only, what they call direct entry, which yeah. was approved by the New York State Department of Labor, yeah. is, is, is people that come through construction skills, helmets to hard hats, 
uh, non-traditional employment for women. Workforce there might be, a, 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 if you look at the housing authority agreement another, or, or build it back, you should ask for the MOU. Right. But otherwise, and I, I was involved in the negotiations with this portion with the yeah. city, you, the law prevents labor from putting anybody directly into an apprenticeship program exactly. unless you, you, you get the direct, uh, direct entry waiver from those programs. So my suggestion is it's the same one I said before. Document best efforts, yeah. okay, uh, uh, and you do the best the best that you can. But that is the only legal way that it can, that you can jump a list. Otherwise, you can refer a person, and there'll be number uh, the electricians had had uh, had an open enrollment the other day. There were nine thousand people for six hundred spots. Mm -hmm. Unless you give up that one that first man in rule, then he can hire that worker. No, and then he's in. No, this is the apprenticeship program. No. And then on top of that, the, the, the workforce utilization. So I want to thank everybody for coming. One, one more. Yes. I just know, as a small company, as you grow, I feel like I'm scared of doing something wrong. So is there any booklet or any direction or guide somewhere that we can? In regards to being a small business, just growing to be larger, yeah. I would I would refer you to the city's yeah. small business services agency, SBS. They have they have they provide the courses. Marcel, he, he just a gentleman just stepped out named Victor, who also works at Mayor's Office of Contracts. Myself, I've taught at it. They provide courses on everything about growing and becoming a bigger business. I assume the federal government and the state probably have similar programs. And we're working with SBS and Marcelo in terms of a curriculum specific for construction. Follow the contract. SBS, Small Business Services. Yeah, just go on the NYC.gov website. You see a nice picture of the mayor doing something nice. And then go down and scroll to the uh, agency. Nothing wrong with it. Honestly, it's good. Okay. I want to thank everybody for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.